Hello, and welcome to the first presentation of the spring 2019 season of the Medical History Interest Group. I'm Melissa Nasia, and I'm the History Collections Librarian at uh, Lapis Library. The Medical History Interest Group presentations are sponsored by the Lapis Library History Collections and the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Studies. Excuse me. If you haven't already done so, please sign in, or you can sign in before you leave, which I think some of you will be doing. If you're attending as part of the ECU Wellness Passport Program, please see Lane Carpenter over here after the program for your stamp. Refreshments are available in the back. Please help yourself. We have three more uh, presentations this semester. And on Monday, February 25th, we will have a history of public health nursing in North Carolina with Shonda Brown, PhD, PhD, GNP, Assistant Professor, School of Nursing at NCANT State University. And there are a few uh, seats kind of scattered throughout, including some over here. Um, on Monday, March 25th, we will have Pierre Fouchard, the father of, mo of modern dentistry, with Valdemir de Reich, who is retired from the School of Dental Medicine and is now in the Department of Physics. On Tuesday, April 9th, so that's a Tuesday, uh, we will have the Transformations of Autism with Jeffrey P. Baker, MD, PhD, Professor of Pediatrics and History, Director of the Trent Center for Bioethics, Humanities, and History of Medicine, Duke University School of Medicine. The History Collections Room has an exhibit about the Country Doctor Museum. The other exhibits are all on the fourth floor around us. We have a pop-up exhibit about Nazi physicians and Holocaust medicine. We have Life and Limb, the Toll of the American Civil War, also scientists and their microscopes. Today's presentation is a dark chapter in military medicine, Nazi physicians and Holocaust medicine. Our presenter is Sheena M. Egan, MPH, PhD, Assistant Professor in the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies. She Sheena Egan is a medical ethicist with advanced and specialized training in military medical ethics, the history of medicine, and public health. Dr. Egan has published original research and presented papers on the topics of military medical ethics, military medical history, bioethics, and public health ethics. She has also lectured with the International Committee of Military Medicine as part of their annual Military Medical Ethics Workshop and the NATO Center for Excellence in Military Medicine. Finally, Dr. Egan has been recognized and affiliated with the Center for Medicine After the Holocaust since 2010. As part of this role, she is trained to educate medical students and physicians about medicine during the Holocaust using history and ethics. Here is Gina Egan with a dark chapter in military <coughs> medicine, Nazi physicians, and Holocaust medicine. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you very much to everyone for coming today. Um, bear with me. I am getting over a cold, so I don't have the normal kind of voice volume that I normally have. But if you can't hear me, just, I don't know, raise, raise your hand or something. Why don't you get the microphone? Um, the microphone actually only uh, provides audio to a recording that's happening right now. But I'll try to project, and I took some cough drops before this. So, as she said, today I'm going to be talking about Nazi physicians and, the Holoca and Holocaust medicine. Um, I decided to start studying physicians during the Holocaust as part of my larger 
um, study of military medical ethics because I realized that the kind of medical atrocities that we saw happen during the Holocaust can really be conceived as kind of a worst case scenario for when the military and medicine can be combined. So I wanted to learn more about how physicians became involved and what they did and what happened to them um, afterwards. I also um, happily am giving this talk today, which coincides beautifully with yesterday, which was the Holocaust Remembrance Day, for those of you who don't know. So the first thing that I want to highlight, I'm sure you are prepared for this since you're coming to a talk on the Holocaust, but I do want to include a warning because there is, of course, a lot of graphic content. I'm going to be saying some things that are emotional and kind of obviously upsetting, and I also use some images from the Holocaust and from the medical atrocities there that can be very troubling. So I just want to kind of give that warning ahead of time. So this is an overview of what we're going to talk about today. I broke it down into kind of three sections to look at first why and how physicians got involved um, with the Nazi regime and the Holocaust. This is the question that kind of first motivated me to start studying Holocaust medicine. I really wondered how these people who are trained as caregivers could end up um, facilitating mass murder. And I think this is a question that probably any of you who have studied um, medicine during the Holocaust have wondered yourself. Um, because after all, not only are the actions really horrific that we'll be talking about, but another thing that kind of makes it extra horrible is the actor, the fact that it is a medical professional that is involved in kind of every stage of um, the genocide that was done by the Nazi regime. And I'm going to talk about um, briefly about National Socialism as applied biology, but I'm going to focus in on the creation of a professional medical association that was known as the National, National Socialist Physicians League. This is my own original research that I did at an archive in Germany. Uh, because this um, NSDAB, I won't even try to say the German words because I will just ruin all of them, but NSDAB is actually mentioned in passing in most literature on the topic of Holocaust medicine, but there isn't much um, really known about this organization. So I wanted to find out the kind of power and influence that it might have had in shaping the practices of Nazi physicians and kind of normalizing uh, <coughs> abnormal behavior. Um, then we'll move into the kind of better known part of um, Holocaust medicine, which is to look at what exactly these physicians did and where physicians were woven into the Holocaust. So we'll uh, focus on institutionalized killing or euthanasia programs and experimentation. And then finally, in just a quick one slide, um, we'll talk about what happened to them afterwards and talk about the Nuremberg trial a little bit. So. When we move to this first question, why and how did physicians get involved in the Nazi party and the Holocaust? As you would imagine, there is really no one answer to this question. It is a very complex question, it's very multifaceted, and it does vary um, based on the individual. However, there is kind of one underlying theme that I think motivated a lot of physicians to end up joining the National Socialist Party and then participating in the atrocities of the Nazis. And that is that National Socialism and its policies were understood as the practical application of medical ideologies and medical science. Specifically, it was sold as applied biology. This was something that was internationally accepted and practiced, and so the physicians very much felt drawn to the government since it was seen to be doing their work, medical work. So at this point, it's really important to recognize what was happening not only in Germany, but also internationally, that really made uh, their participation in these atrocities possible. In the first half of the 20th century is when we see this kind of era of eugenics. And I could actually talk about eugenics for an hour, but I will not. I will just give you a very kind of brief overview of what um, eugenics means. But essentially, it's racism cloaked in medical authority and scientific ideology. 
So this moment in history, the early 20th century, was actually a kind of perfect moment for all of these things to come together. Uh, there were the perfect ingredients for the development and application of a racialized medical ideology, such as eugenics. Eugenicists were inspired by the work of Darwin, um, The Origin of Species, as well as the Industrial Revolution and concepts of animal breeding. They thought that they could improve human race through selective and restrictive breeding by deciding who should marry who and have children with whom and preventing the breeding of undesirable populations. Very importantly, eugenics was internationally accepted and celebrated. A lot of times when people talk about this period and they talk about Holocaust medicine, people want to believe that this is some sort of unique evil that is locked within the boundaries of Germany during that time, but that is very much not true. And eugenics started in the early 20th century and were really pervasive internationally. So we even see um, international eugenics conferences that start in 1912 and that are attended by really well-known countries like the United States, Canada, Germany, the UK. Um, and these, or this conference continued to meet up until and throughout the early years of World War II, with the Germans continuing to attend. The most important thing to remember about eugenics is that it was understood a scientific fact. It was something that all doctors, or not all, but most doctors believed in. Essentially, to not believe in eugenics at that period would be akin to a physician not believing in genetics now. So it was heralded as scientific fact. Another really important part about eugenics is that it is um, kind of intimately linked to the idea of government. So according to the International Conference on Eugenics, they said that every government has a responsibility to apply these eugenic ideologies and ensure the success of its population. So ensuring the proper breeding and therefore kind of general public health. This was seen as something that good governments should engage in. And this was an announcement that came out from this international conference. So <clears throat> this made government work, of course, medical work, and created the need for physicians on all levels. But the Nazi party, or the National Socialist Party, really took this eugenic idea and ran with it. It's also important to note that I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but before World War II and post-World War I, Germany was in a very bad state, and physicians within um, Germany didn't have the same kind of power, privilege, and money that they had had before World War I. So as the government was moving forward, talking about National Socialism as applied biology, talking about how they were going to apply the eugenic ideologies to kind of large public health programs, physicians saw an ability to gain the power and privilege that they had lost by joining in with this kind of large um, national move. Put bluntly, doctors became deeply involved with the work of the Nazi regime because that work was seen as medical. Doctors needed to do it. But before uh, these doctors or these physicians joined the military or ever even became an official member of a political party, <coughs> There was a professional medical association that was established called the National Socialist Physicians League. This group, as I said, is only mentioned in passing. And so I went to an archive up in a place called Bad Arsoliv in Germany and um, spent about a week going through transcripts from the Nuremberg trials as well as other archived materials that they had there. It was part of the International Tracing Services, or ITS, and they have an archive there. So I am very interested in this professional medical association because as I've come to realize in medical ethics, a lot of times physicians look to professional medical organizations as a source of moral guidance. They look to them to see what they should and shouldn't do. So the fact that we see this 
um, kind of Nazi affiliate medical professional associations start years before the Nazis rose to power, I think can really highlight why this behavior became so normalized for them. So this is the German word, which I swear I could say at one point when I was at the archives, but since, I, since then I can't say this National Socialist Deutsche Arztbund. But it's translated as the National Socialist Physicians League. So this organization was founded in 1929 by a doctor named Leonardo Conti. In total, it's said that roughly 2,500 physicians, or 6% of the physician population in Germany, joined the NSDAB during its very first year. And it continued to grow as membership became less optional and more forced. This organization was, of course, heavily influenced by political ideologies that were both racist and eugenic. And importantly, although this organization would later be formally absorbed into the Nazi party, at the beginning it was started by physicians and operated independently. So to understand the mission of the NSDAB, we can look to its formative doctrine. Um, one of its primary calls was to be a promotion or to promote racial hygiene, racial science, and eugenic knowledge within the medical community and Germany writ large. They also wanted to provide subject matter experts in all areas of public health and racial biology uh, to the Nazi party. These largely eugenic goals were of course in line with the Nazi parties. The organization's alliance with and close association to the Nazi party can also be seen in other kind of formalized doctrine. So the first official charter of the NSDAB did not require membership in the Nazi party, but it did expect adherence to the values and worldview of National Socialism from all of its members. And the kind of optional status of being a member of the National Socialist Workers Party um, fell away, and in subsequent charters in the following years, membership became required. So when you look at the official um, documentation about NSDAB, it does sell itself as being a kind of pacifist organization. However, when you look to um, the transcripts from the Nuremberg trials, you can find um, personal accounts from members of the NSDAB that are very disturbing and tell of how Early on in the organization's history, it began to collectively terrorize non-Nazi doctors. So, in fact, in 1933, many Jewish doctors were bullied and brutalized by NSDAB members. This organization thus played a really sinister role in actively promoting the Nazi party and the anti-Semitism that was a part of that. This is an example of some of the organized harassment and brutality that occurred. And this occurred April 1st, 1933, and in the days prior. And I'll just read the quote. It says, members of NSDAB and uniformed members of SA went early in the morning to take Jewish doctors from their bed, maltreat them, and drove them to a wasteland in the middle of nowhere. There they made them run at gunpoint, some 80 years of age, while they laughed and mocked them. They took turns beating them, then left them without care for 24 to 48 hours. A few days before that, some Jewish doctors were invited under the pretext of a consultation. They were then driven to the woods, beaten, and abandoned. This is obviously deeply horrifying, and I think that it's really interesting that the, f or the fact that these Jewish professionals were lured under the pretext of a consultation really attests to the professional daily interactions that Jewish and non-Jewish physicians were still having during this time and how they kind of used this trust within the professional medical community to lure Jewish doctors specifically um, to terrorize and abuse them. There isn't um, much more about the actual activities that the NSDAB engaged in when we're talking about kind of brutalizing and harassing people. However, it is said that when um, Leonardo Conti took power in 1933, one of his missions was a, a systematic and widespread um, 
bullying or brutalization of non-Nazi and Jewish doctors specifically. It's also really important to note that the NSDAB and its influence did not stop just within the practicing medical community in Germany. In 1935, the organization inaugurated a so-called daughter NSDAB for medical students in the German medical schools. This point really points to the far-reaching um, nature of this organization because although membership was supposedly optional for medical students, those who did not join were seen as suspect, socially um, ostracized, and often abused or mistreated, making membership essentially mandatory. The NSDAB was also a powerful and influential organization, and I, I say this based on this archival research. So in 1939, the NSDAB was included as one of only 10 options on an internal Nazi statistical survey, alongside other organizations such as the SS and the SA. The NSDAB was significant enough to warrant severe penalties by liberators. People who were a part of NSDAB can no longer hold public office or um, work in the universities of Germany. It was also one of the 45 groups that were dissolved along with the Nazi party upon liberation. Furthermore, some of the members of NSDAB, and specifically those who held leadership positions, achieved very high status within the Nazi hierarchy, which is really telling of their influence and the influence of this organization. So Dr. Leonardo Conti was the founder of NSDAB and went on to become um, its leader. He was a member of the National Socialist Workers' Party uh, when he joined and later became a member of SS. He also held um, other high-ranking health positions within the National Socialist government to include being in charge of the health services at the Berlin Olympics and some other high-ranking kind of regional leadership positions in the SS. There were also many other prominent Nazi physicians who were members of the NSDAB. So there was a one gentleman by the name of Walter Gross, and he was the founder and leader of the Information Office for Population Policy and Racial Hygiene. And he later also developed and led the Racial Policy Office of the NSDAP until the end of the war. Uh, there was also a Dr. Kurt Bloom who served as second in command for the NSDAB and became a high-ranking official in the SA and received the Gold Party Badge um, as he took on yet another higher position within the SA. Um, throughout my archival work, I wasn't able to find a kind of full and complete membership list. Um, this is just kind of patched together by people who mentioned um, their affiliation with NSDAB. So the NSDAB was really ruthless in its abuse of Jewish and non-Nazi doctors. The organization was forceful in pushing eugenic and national socialist ideologies on both practicing doctors and medical students. As I said, membership was not really optional. If you were practicing medicine in Germany and you wanted to keep on practicing it, you had to become a member of this group. Beyond that, those in command held positions of power and authority and I would argue that this organization was likely powerful in normalizing, desensitizing, and legitimizing behavior that could never be justified by any normative theory of professional or even just kind of regular ethics. They got involved with this organization that really just made um, anti-Semitism and the abuse of particularly Jewish physicians to be very normal and to be legitimated by an entire hierarchy and professional organization. So when, Nazis, uh, when the Nazis rose to power, they did so with a eugenics-based ideology. Doctors, because of that, seeing government work as medical work, as I mentioned before, joined the Nazi party in greater numbers than any other professional group. More than 38,000 physicians joined the Nazi party, which is said to be almost half of all doctors in Germany. And that um, all doctors in Germany still included Jewish doctors who would have never been accepted into the party. 
Um, also, more than 7% of all physicians were members of the SS, and this is compared to less than 0.5% of the general population. So you can see that physicians are very much overrepresented in the SS, which is important because it not only shows their kind of power and influence within Nazi hierarchy, but also positions them um, to go to the concentration camps and extermination camps, where we will see them enact this kind of institutionalized killing that they first practice in hospitals. So now that we understand the motivations behind um, physicians joining, or maybe the foundation of some of the Nazi medical policies, we can move forward to see what medicine or medicine looked like under the Nazis. Um, the historical trajectory of their involvement is what, what some might consider a real slippery slope. And that's another possible reason that I think physicians may have become involved um, with the atrocities of the Holocaust. Essentially, they began with the same type of forced sterilizations that were seen here in the United States and accepted internationally. And then this slippery slope of horror ends in them eventually facilitating genocide. So I'm going to do, uh, for the rest of this talk, an uh, overview of what medicine looked like during the Nazi regimes. Um, I'm going to focus on institutionalized killing and medical experiments, as I feel like that is where a bulk of the atrocities happened. But I do want to mention that sterilization laws were enacted fairly quickly when the National Socialists rose to power. And these sterilization laws were seen as part of negative eugenics, which is when you prevent the breeding of uh, populations that, at this time, the Nazis had deemed um, socially undesirable. It is said that approximately 400,000 Germans were sterilized between 1934 and 1939, primarily using bilateral tubal ligation and vasectomy. The Nuremberg Laws quickly followed, and these are essentially three laws that were passed between September and November of 1935, a Reich citizenship law, a law for the protection of German blood and German honor, and the law for the protection of the genetic health of the German people. All of these laws um, attempted to enact eugenic ideologies by deciding who counted as a German citizen and who didn't, according to this eugenic ranking of inferior and superior races that the Nazis were. Um, out there and believing in. Um, it also attempted to prevent uh, Jewish and non-Jewish people from marrying and having children. So this was all meant to kind of use the science of eugenics to make for the healthiest Volk, i.e. the Aryan Volk, while cutting out what the Nazis called essentially kind of cancers or illnesses within society that were in fact people and populations. So we're going to now focus on institutionalized killing. I, again, am sorry. This will be very depressing. Um, we'll look at how it's, again, kind of a slippery slope where we see them start with child euthanasia and then end in the final solution. And then we'll talk about some of the uh, medical experiments that happened at the hands of Nazi physicians, uh, primarily at Auschwitz and Dachau. So when I talk about institutionalized killings, these Killings were enacted in a lot of different places, in a lot of different ways. Uh, they were all conceptualized as being mercy killings or euthanasia. And they were seen as a kind of medical solution uh, for those populations that were deemed inferior, according to the Nazi ideology. Importantly, the active involvement of physicians in this process was both authorized and mandated by Hitler himself as seen in this formal declaration. So in this formal declaration um, signed in Berlin in 1939, Hitler specifically enlarges the responsibilities of, of certain physicians to include the killing of what he calls incurable patients. So it makes um, the death of these populations part of medical practice. It puts it within the realm of the physician. This was often talked about um, within the formal policy of that era as being a final treatment for an incurable population. So according to this Nazi ideology, these populations 
um, were predisposed to disease or already had diseases, and they needed to uh, be killed to cut that out of the German folk. So the institutionalized killing began with the child euthanasia program. And I think this is a very interesting case that not a lot of people know about. But in fact, the child euthanasia program, which is the first of the institutionalized killing programs, is purported to have started um, upon the request of a parent for the government to kill his son. So a father wrote to Hitler, um, completely buying into this completely pervasive eugenic ideology that was being fed to the German Volk through propaganda and even in the school system. And he had a severely handicapped and developmentally ch um, challenged son. He said that this son's life was not worth living, that he was a burden on the family and on the Volk, and so he requested the mercy killing of his son. Hitler granted this uh, first case of euthanasia, and it happened at a pediatric hospital. It was done by lethal injection by a physician. After this happened, more and more petitions started to come in, all coming from parents who had completely ingested this eugenic ideology and were desperate to um, free the Volk of what was seen as a burden, these developmentally challenged and handicapped people. So for a while, this led to an understanding that the euthanasia practices were in some ways beneficent. They were requested by the parent to relieve the suffering of a child. But that didn't last long. And I say that because I think that's another way that maybe physicians could have rationalized being a part of it um, if it's requested by the parent and you're working in this pediatric hospital and you're all on board with eugenics. But soon, physicians replaced parents. So this kind of builds in that the child euthanasia program kind of answers the question, what, you can sterilize people, but what do you do with all the people that have already been born that you also don't want? This is the problem facing Nazis. So Hitler doesn't want to have to wait around for all parents to volunteer their children. That is never going to happen. So instead what he does is he institutes um, a mandatory registration of all so-called malformed newborn children. And there was a list of specific kind of diagnoses that met this criteria. But essentially, if a doctor um, delivered or encountered a newborn child that met any of these criteria, they were supposed to register that child. They filled out this application, which then went to something called a genetic health court. So this genetic health court was very interestingly um, meant to ensure the medical validity of the diagnosis and appropriate treatment, and also they claimed to avoid racism or other abuses of the euthanasia policy. So once one of these malformed infants was registered, their application would go to this genetic health court, which included two physicians, um, one of which at least had to have a expertise in genetic health or eugenics or social anthropology or one of all these many words that all meant the same thing. And then there was also a lawyer. And then these three men decided whether or not these children would live or die. Methods of killing ranged from lethal injection and tablets to poisonous gassings and neglect. In 1941, very problematically, the child euthanasia program is first expanded. So it's expanded several times. But the first time that it's expanded, it's expanded to no longer just be reserved for newborns, but also to include infants and minors. So now all minors are included, not just institutionalized children and not just um, those with a specific category of disease. We see the kind of ailments, if you want to say, that put you on this application get slowly widened. So when we first see it, it's something, some things like microcephaly, um, epilepsy, and 
gross deformation, and then it gets wider and wider until it eventually includes all children of unwanted races. And this is again built into the eugenic ideology, because I put in there that it included healthy children of unwanted races. But the reality of the fact is that according to the eugenic ideology at this time, it was impossible for someone of an unwanted race to be healthy. These people were seen, according to um, eugenicists and Nazis, as being predisposed to disease or already diseased and not yet showing symptoms. So in this way, even though I say healthy children, it is still seen as a diseased population that's in need of treatment. During this initial phase of the euthanasia program, it said that more than 5,000 children were killed. We don't have um, completely specific numbers on this because when physicians replace parents, we also start to see a lot of children being taken from their parents being told that they're going to be cared for, and then a standardized letter goes out to all the parents saying, oh, there was an in infectious disease that ran rampant in the institution, so we had to, or so your child died, and we had to cremate them to avoid further infection. So after um, the child euthanasia program, we see it again expanded. And this time it's expanded to include adults in psychiatric institutions. This was a covert operation. As I said, it initially started out as being a parental request. And as um, physicians took over, it gets driven more and more underground. So this um, operated under the code name T4. It had a similar paperwork and approval process. So uh, psychiatric patients who met a specific diagnostic criteria, their physicians filled out applications for them, and then these um, applications were evaluated by a board of 48 medical doctors. Very interestingly, this application emphasized ability to work. So it's still falling within that eugenic ideology and understanding, but it's starting to move more and more away from the medical. Now it's about the value that they can provide to the German Volk, buying into this idea of um, the burdens that the healthy Volk were um, bearing. So of a total of 283,000 applications that were filled out during this uh, T4 period, 75,000 were marked for death. The first executions uh, were carried out during the military campaign against Poland. And it's at this time that we start to see physicians essentially experimenting with the most effective ways of gassing populations. So the physician is um, developing different gas chambers. This is one of the earlier ones. Um, and this practice became so normalized that one hospital even went so far as to celebrate the death or killing of its thousandth patient by passing out beers for everyone. And they toasted and celebrated. So it was so normalized. It was not even really seen as, seen as evil. It was mundane to these doctors, warranting celebration. So as I said, this was happening covertly, but one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, why didn't anyone stand up and say no? Why didn't anyone try to stop this from happening? There's no way they were hiding it that well. And of course, people did find out about it. Um, apparently, one of the ways that uh, this was kind of unveiled was that a fairly, or a person who was part of a pretty, uh, pretty well-off family was killed as part of this euthanasia program and then sent, and then their family received a standardized letter that said that they had died because of appendicitis. But this person had already had their appendix removed. Mm -hmm. And so it made the family say, what, that doesn't make sense. And then as they dug in, um, they started to uncover what was happening. And so we see protests from this family, and then we also start to see increasing protests by the clergy, who is seeing um, their own congregants kind of swept up in uh, this eugenic um, euthanasia program. And so they start to speak out um, against it and protest. And what happens is that 
The killing does not stop, but it's instead driven further underground. And this is called uh, the so-called wild euthanasia program. And it's called the wild euthanasia program because prior to this, when we're talking about child euthanasia and T4, there is at least the guise of um, checks and balances. There is this genetic health court. There's paperwork. You know, physicians are checking it over. But as soon as we enter the wild euthanasia program, um, there's no longer this series of checks and balances. Doctors could now kill on their own initiative. They didn't have the formality of application. And it also meant, uh, since it wasn't so tightly controlled by the government, that killing started to happen less by gassing and more by neglect, um, starvation, and drug overdose. So in particular, they chose to leave psychiatric patients out in the cold or not feed them so that they would die, but it would um, not, be, not be seen to have been something that the physician actively did. So during World War I, I want to say tens of thousands, but a large number of people in psychiatric hospitals died because they couldn't um, get any food. There wasn't enough to go around in World War I Germany. So this had happened then, and the Nazis very smartly realized that, oh, well, we can kind of buy into this again. We can leave people out, and they'll just think, oh, this is what happens in war. Um, we need to ration to the people that you know, are fighting at the front. We need to do those kind of things. So it makes sense that these people will die. But of course, um, they were being euthanized. There's also an increase in suffocation and low um, poisoning given over a long period of time to slowly kill people. At there, or it says that at least another 70,000 patients are killed during the next four years of this wild euthanasia program. So then we move into Operation 14F13. Uh, this happened in spring of 1941, and it's when the T4 killings were expanded beyond the adult patients of psychiatric facilities to include all prisoners in the concentration camps. Um, this Operation 14F13 is often referred to in um, Nazi doctrine as special treatment 14F13, and this language is used um, specifically by the SS and the police to maintain this murder as a medicalized treatment. It was seen as a final treatment for an incurable population. This leads us very quickly into uh, physician involvement in the final solution, or rather the mass murder of Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and many other populations that were deemed undesirable and diseased by the Nazi regime. So in January of 1944 is when we start this extermination through work campaign. And we also see the same physicians that had been responsible for euthanasia operations in hospitals around Germany uh, be the ones that formulated criteria and administered the first phases of the destruction of the Jews and other populations in concentration camps. But Doctors were involved in much more than just the gas chambers when we're talking about Final Solution and the concentration camps. And this is one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize, that doctors played a very big role in concentration camps and in the formation of Nazi policies. So doctors were responsible for ramp and camp selections. For those of you who don't know, ramp selections refer to the initial kind of triage that happens when prisoners would arrive at concentration camps. There would be a physician who was waiting on the ramp as the cattle cars were unloaded, and they would say right or left. One direction meant that you were going to a concentration camp um, to experience extermination through work. You were seen as healthy and able-bodied enough to contribute to the German war machine doing the many things that happened in concentration camps. The other direction was um, primarily women, children, the elderly, also um, the disabled, and those people were sent immediately to the crematorium. And it was a doctor that did this selection because it was understood that a doctor is the only one who can really 
tell if someone is able-bodied. You know, they're engaging in some sort of on-the-fly eugenic diagnoses. Uh, there is also another more nefarious, or more nefarious, there's another nefarious um, reason that physicians in, were involved in ramp selections, and this is also because, as I'm about to talk about, they did a lot of medical experimentation in concentration camps, and physicians wanted to be able to really be on the front lines to identify the people that they wanted to do experiments on, whether they were looking for a specific population or a specific type of what they often called scientific or clinical material. So physicians also accompanied patients in a fake Red Cross car that would take them to the crematoriums, Physicians were responsible um, for choosing the appropriate number of pellets of gas, of Zyklon B, to be used in um, the gas chambers. They were also responsible for observing the actual gassing to um, say when people are dead, essentially, and then order the opening of the gas chamber. They also observed um, the mass gassings as part of this kind of constant strive towards efficiency. They were trying to figure out how many people they could fit in, how many pellets they could use to kind of kill the most with the least. Um, other things that they did is that they, of course, signed forms confirming that the people were dead, and they also oversaw the extraction of hair and teeth from the corpses to be used for recycling and sale. So, uh, they very much used every part of this population that they had deemed incurable. Um, they used skin to make leather goods, such as wallets and lampshades. Um, they used human fat for soap within the concentration camp. They removed all the hair from the body so that it could be used as um, an incendiary, to be used in bombs so that it could be lit. So there was Oh, and then they would also remove any fillings or gold teeth to then be melted down and redistributed throughout the German population. So while this final solution is being carried out, physicians involved themselves in further atrocities. And I think that this is the really well-known part of Holocaust medicine, and it is the medical experiments that happened within the concentration camps. So these medical experiments were numerous and extensive. They were carried out, planned by, and um, completely involving physicians at every level. We don't know a ton about all of the medical experiments because so many documents and reports were destroyed upon liberation, but I'm going to focus on the kind of three best known um, experiments that happened in concentration camps, the high altitude and decompression studies, the hypothermia or rewarming studies, and the twin studies done by Joseph Mengele, who most people have probably heard of. So a lot of the research that happened within the concentration camp, or the ones that we know about anyway, um, were tied to essentially the ongoing military campaigns. They could be seen as military research. The first case of this is these high altitude experiments. So World War II really saw the first significant use of air warfare. And this meant that aviation medicine didn't exist. Physicians really did not know how high altitude affected the human body. And they wanted to find out. So they created this experiment. And what it involved is essentially inmates being placed into a low pressure chamber that could simulate up to 68,000 feet. Um, the fact that it could simulate up to 68,000 feet is significant because at the time planes couldn't go higher than like 30,000. And so the fact that they're testing it up that high really starts to show how it's skewing away from medical science and really moving into just kind of torture and abuse. Um, as these uh, people were in this compression chamber, physicians monitored their physiological response as they dialed up the altitude, watching them lose consciousness. 200 people were said to have been subjected to these experiments. 80 died in the compression chamber, and the remainder were executed dissect and dissected or vivisected. So there was one physician in particular who was very interested in vivisection 
For those of you who don't know what it is, it's very traumatic, but it is dissecting a live human being. So what they would do is they would remove um, the subject from the compression chamber after they'd lost consciousness, but before they had died, and then this physician would would then do a vivisection of the brain. And this is because he thought that altitude sickness was caused by tiny air bubbles in the brain. And so there is a large number, although the number is unknown, of people who were dissected alive and without anesthetic. And that is problematically a reoccurring theme throughout the medical experiments. So the next of the well-known studies is the hypothermia or rewarming experiments. These were done at Dachau uh, by a doctor the, by the name of Dr. Rasher, and it again had a kind of military application goal. So they were trying to determine the most effective way of rewarming um, their military service members because there had been pilots that had been injecting into cold water and suffering from hypothermia, and other soldiers uh, fighting on the very cold Russian front that were also succumbing to hypothermia. So they needed to know, or they wanted to know, how to bring someone back from this hypothermic state. So what they would do is um, they would put victims in either vats of icy water or outside for up to five hours. These primarily men would either be in aviator suits or naked. Um, they are said to have writhed in pain and foamed at the mouth and lost consciousness as they entered into a hypothermic state. As this was happening, um, a physician was monitoring uh, their physiological response and in particular monitoring the internal body temperature. When it fell to 79.7, that's when um, the doctors and their assistants would try to rewarm him. So they tried rewarming a number of ways. They rewarmed him by putting him into hot sleeping bags and scalding baths, which sounds torturous for anyone who has had, I don't know, a cold extremity and put it in a hot bath. It feels like pins and needles. I can't imagine how this would feel. And then again, kind of moving from any kind of guise of medical science towards torture, they did, at least in one case, use a Catholic priest as the subject and then force Catholic nuns to have sex with him, to attempt him to be rewarmed. That was not an adequate way to rewarm someone and obviously is more about torturing prisoners. There were some 80 to 100 patients that perished during these experiments. We don't know how many people were involved. This experiment has probably gotten the most kind of coverage, at least in medical ethics and research ethics, because this is said to be the only Nazi experiment that actually produced any sort of medical knowledge. It is from these experiments that we know how to rewarm people with hypothermia, that you rewarm the, the core and the neck first. So it's received a lot of coverage, and I think it's important to note that of all the experiments that have happened, this is the only one that is said to have even slightly contributed to um, science. So Joseph Mengele is probably the best known <coughs> Nazi physician. Um, he was known as the Angel of Death, and he was a pretty well-celebrated physician in Germany. He had two doctorate degrees and practiced at very um, big and powerful and important hospitals. But he is definitely infamous because of what he did at Auschwitz, which is where he worked the ramps, or did the ramp selections, did the camp selections, and did a lot of medical experimentation. Uh, one of the reasons that he worked the ramps besides medical experimentation was that he was also interested in collecting uh, medical oddities and different kind of specimens for further study throughout Germany. So he is said to have collected a lot of scientific material for the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes and other um, German institutes. These or the scientific material included eyes. Uh, limbs, and that's a troubling image of a bunch of legs that have been removed for that purpose. Um, it also included internal organs, sera from twins that had been deliberately infected with typhoid and other diseases, as well as any kind of oddities. So if he found someone with uh, deformation of some kind, um, that limb or body part would be 
kept and sent away. Um, but beyond collecting the scientific material, he did a lot of experiments. He is said to have been obsessed with twins and he was obsessed with twins for a lot of reasons. One of the kind of missions of Nazi Germany or the German Volk was to um, make kind of as many Aryan babies as you could. That was a part of the positive side of eugenics. Positive, I mean promoting birth as opposed to um, negative, which is trying to restrict breeding. And so he was really interested in twins because he wanted to understand what he called the secrets of multiple births. Because essentially, if you could uncover those secrets and make sure that all good, good German women are having multiple babies every time, then you will be able to populate the world much faster with Aryans. And this is combined with, at the time, a series of national socialist policies that restricted the employment that women could have and mandated a certain number of offspring that a woman is supposed to have throughout her life. Um, and to kind of militarize this, women would in fact receive different levels of military commendation for the different numbers of children that they had with bronze, silver, and gold. And I believe gold, they had estimated that a healthy woman should be able to birth 14 children in her lifetime. So that, that's how you got the gold star. Um, so he was interested in twins for that, but he was also interested in twins because they provided to him the kind of perfect case in control. If you wanted to understand how infectious disease affected the body and you had identical twins, you could infect one and not infect the other and then wait for the disease to take its course, um, kill both, dissect both side by side, and have this case control for um, disease progression in the body. So there are many stories of that. One of the reasons we know a lot about Joseph Mengele is because he was working with such a young population. It is um, the survivors, or it is his experiments that have the largest number of survivors. So we've been able to get a lot of stories from them about things that happened to them or their twins and siblings. Um, other things that he did were, I include this one because it just always terrifies me and I don't see why he would do it, but he supervised the attempt to create artificial Siamese twins by sewing um, two twins together at um, the palm of their hands. Uh, their hands, of course, uh, became necrotic and the infection became so extreme that they died. He also attempted to change eye color, again buying into this kind of Aryan conception of an ideal and was trying to figure out how to change people's eyes to be the color blue. And so he injected a series of chemicals and different um, liquids into children's eyes. He also experimented with amputation. This is said to perhaps be connected to the military um, uh, and their interest in being able to reattach amputated limbs. Uh, but what he is known for is quite literally cutting the healthy limbs off of two identical twins and then switching them and sewing them back on to see if that would work. And then lastly, he is perhaps most notorious for a vivisection. As part of his desire to understand multiple births, he would work the ramps and specifically look for any pregnant women. Any pregnant women that he could find, he would then perform a live vivisection to understand the workings of the human or the female body. He is one of the few physicians who escaped and he actually, since I said there was a large group of survivors from his studies, they actually made it a mission to try to track him down and they later found him in Brazil, uh, but he had died a week before they found him in some, I think, scuba diving accident, so in 1979. But he is said to have escaped to Brazil where he actually continued his research on twins. So some of the other medical experiments that happened there that we know less about are the famine studies, the seawater studies, and the wound infection studies. All of these have kind of military application, the first one being limited to the concentration camps, but essentially the famine studies involved a group of um, gypsy children, and they were just quite simply starved. 
Uh, there were some that were given minimal food, but this was meant to inform the extermination through work campaign of the concentration camps. Essentially, they were trying to figure out how little of food you could give someone so that they could continue to work but could not live on that diet. So they were trying to develop this diet that would give someone perhaps a month or two of work before their eventual decline and death. Um, the seawater potability studies were again kind of geared towards um, a military application because so many of their pilots were ejecting into seawaters and becoming dehydrated. They wanted to know how long someone could live off of seawater alone and whether or not sea if seawater could be made potable. Um, I don't know about the actual potability studies, but they did get a group of gypsies and give them only drinking water with no, f or only drinking water, only seawater to drink with no food just to see how long they would live. Finally, the wound infection and mutilation experiments, these were done primarily on women and they were to address a problem within the German troops of a lot of their soldiers getting gas gangrene um, in their battlefield infections. And so what they did is they simulated battlefield injuries um, on these female prisoners. They would cut them, shoot them, and then they would usually inject some sort of pathogen or virus like gas gangrene and then further aggravate the wound by rubbing sawdust or ground glass into it and then they would just watch the infection develop. And then once it got to a certain stage, they tried different things like sulfidamides to attempt to kind of fight back the infection. So, what happened to them at the end? Um, this is my final slide. But so after liberation, German physicians, some escaped, some were brought to the United States on something called Operation Paperclip, which I can talk about later. But one of the things that's really significant about um, what happened to the physicians is that many of them were in fact put on trial at this Nuremberg trial. There were 23 defendants that were physicians that were put up in the doctor's trial on four counts. The counts were the common design or conspiracy to commit crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and membership in a criminal organization. Very importantly to the world of research ethics, what came out of the Nuremberg trial was the Nuremberg Code. Because as they were trying to try these doctors for what they knew to be medical atrocities, they realized that there was no kind of standardized code of ethics for research against which to judge them and find them deficient. And so they created this 10-point code of human experimentation ethics, which they laid out and used as a yardstick against which to measure these physicians and find them wanting. Um, Fifteen were found guilty and seven were hung. Uh, there were a few cases of people that were acquitted. Uh, for any of you who have read the book Nazi Doctors, there is a very troubling physician in there who's named Dr. Wirth, and he, is, he kind of unhinges or throws on its top this idea that all Nazi physicians were super evil and horrible, and he ends up being this kind of weird character just trapped in a bad moment in history trying to do his best. And because of this, the um, Prisoners actually lobbied to have him acquitted, and he was, but most were not. So I know that was very much a brief, brief overview of a lot of material on Holocaust medicine. I want to um, thank the International Tracing Service where I did this archival research and my mentors, and additionally the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst where I first presented this, and they gave me a lot of really good feedback. So. With that, I'm done. If you haven't already done so, please uh, sign the attendance sheet before you leave. And refresh, refreshments are in the back. Um, in order for both you and also the people who view this presentation later. We want you to uh, raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you. Um, you never want to hear a, 
a answer without a question. Context is, is a lot of things. So anybody who has a question, raise your hand, and I will start bringing the microphone to you. Somebody in the middle here. Were, were you able to find out how, what, what came first? Was it the hatred of Jews that led to the genetics? Or did the genetics somehow feed into this notion that there was a Jewish gene or a Jewish racial type? Well, I would say that, very unfortunately, anti-Semitism is definitely not time-bound to this period, and it definitely predates the eugenic movement. Um, eugenics was not necessarily just anti-Semitic. It was about inferior and superior races. And so even though anti-Semitism is woven through it almost everywhere, and I will say anti-Semitism was very, very widely just kind of accepted at this time period, and Jews were used as scapegoats. But the eugenics movement looks a lot different in uh, different countries. So for instance, in the United States, the eugenics movement is way more about uh, white versus black and also about um, a kind of stigmatization of the Irish. That's what we see a lot, just because of the time period when it's coming in. I'm not exactly sure how to articulate this question, but that's 23 physicians out of 50 or 60,000 most of whom were coerced into becoming in the Nazi party or mm -hmm. the medical organization. I'm, wanna, I'm wondering to what extent uh, physicians re receive special treatment by the Nuremberg trials compared to um, military war criminals. Hmm. I agree. I think that 23 is definitely not sufficient. I think it had more to do with their ability to prove the wrongdoing and that these 23 physicians, I believe, almost uniformly came from the concentration camps as opposed to those kind of pre-concentration camp era institutionalized killings that I've talked about. Um, I will say that I do think the physicians were in many ways privileged over other non-physicians. And we see this not just in Germany, but also um, on the Japanese side of the war, on both sides, the United States government and maybe other governments, but at least the United States government gave um, these physicians kind of get out of jail free cards because they wanted the information that they had gathered. So they thought, you know, this kind of experimentation, same with the experimentation that happened with Unit 731 in Japan, they said, we could never do this in the United States. So we kind of want to know what happened. And so they offered a lot of immunity deals. And like I said, there was this whole thing called um, Operation Paperclip where a lot of them came to the United States including San Antonio, which is where I was living when I found out about it. Um, my understanding is that Mengele lived under his own name in Germany for four years. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why he never came to the attention to the US was because he was only a captain. Many most of the 23 folks that were Very tried had higher rank than him. So the U.S. and the trials were primarily high officers, mm -hmm. colonels, generals, etc. When uh, he started getting a whiff that there might be problems with his uh, involvement in previously, uh, he and many others escape to South America. Okay. So one of the things you said is a few physicians, I, I, it is unknown how many yeah. uh, Nazi officers, and of course, if they were not officers, they were easy to, if, if colonels can, can escape and captains can escape, you know, uh, other sympathizers would, would have an easy time. I mean, he got German passport under his own name for several years and uh, he was able to get out of Germany with his name and, and get a boat uh, to 
I think Argentina originally. Yes, many escaped to Argentina. But I think that that's a really important point. A lot of not just physicians, but other members, members of the Nazi party continued to just kind of live in Germany. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to highlight how pervasive that eugenic ideology was. I mean, I even found examples of um, eugenic calculations being woven into middle school math classes where they would literally calculate the monetary burden of institutionalized populations. So this was something that really um, took over the whole country. So it's kind of easy to slip back in and continue to hide. I think about when I lived in Germany, I had a military friend of mine tell me that they still even have SS reunions in some parts of Germany that the cops know about and just kind of turn away from. But thank you for your comments. I just have uh, two quick questions. One is about the National Socialist Physicians League, this NSDAB. Mm -hmm. To what extent, in terms of decision making, was it its own independent body in terms of the Nazi hierarchy? To what extent was it simply, it almost sounds like in some ways the medical wing of the SS? Which of those interpretations would you think is more accurate? Hmm. And well, originally. Originally, it was its own independent organization, so it can really be seen as just a professional medical association, mm. essentially, that ends up being absorbed by uh, the Nazi party later on. Um, I don't know that they, as a group, had a lot of formative power in policy development or in kind of enacting larger plans, but the leadership of the NSDAB did because of their affiliation with the Nazi party. So I wouldn't, I don't think I would say it's a medical branch of the SS, but it is this medical thing that then got subsumed. But not everyone was an SS member in that okay. organization. Uh, the other question I had, I was glad you mentioned Unit 731 because I was just curious how you would compare the Nazi medical experiments to Unit 731 because you had in J Unit 731, you had these widespread Japanese biological warfare experiments. You had a lot of the same kinds of atrocities. Mm -hmm. Infect someone with a disease and then vivisect them to see how it worked. And you even had the, according to at least some scholars, the operational use of those results in terms of actual Japanese biological warfare in China in the 1930s and early 40s. So mm -hmm. I was just curious if you had any thoughts in terms of uh, comparing the two. I think that there is a lot of significant overlap between what the two groups were doing. For those of you who don't know, Unit 731 is um, a, a kind of lesser known version of this evil that happened um, in Manchuria under the command of Ishishiro. There's a really good book called The Factories of Death, but essentially they took Manchurian populations, literally just imprisoned them, and then did a bunch of medical experimentation on the same things, on hypothermia, um, on kind of wound management, where they would put people on posts all around a bomb, blow up the bomb, and then just see how it affected other people. But I would say that there's a couple of significant differences. Um, Unit 731, almost all of those physicians continue to practice medicine and have pretty high achieving or high positions throughout Japan in the post years. None, almost none of them were brought to trial except in a trial that happened um, in the Soviet Union that the United States denounced as a show trial. But then also the other really significant difference that I see is that Unit 731 used to go beyond this kind of death camp to also do experiments on local populations where they did things like give out um, cookies laced with anthrax to children just to see if they could spread it or fly over with a basket full of plague infested fleas that would just kind of fly off and go across the landscape. So the, they're both super evil, but those are the differences and similarities that I would say. And also Unit 731 has not received nearly as much scholarship as Nazi physicians. Thank you, Professor, for your brilliant lecture. Um, so as far as I understand, you mostly concentrate on um, physicians. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, have you compared physicians' involvement and dentists' involvement? And because uh, as far I, I think that uh, there were also uh, dental experiments in in the camps. Um, yeah, thank you. I have not done that comparison, although I'm sure it would be interesting. I know that there were a lot of nurses that were involved, especially throughout um, the institutionalized killing that happened um, in the pediatric and adult psychiatric hospitals. I know the nurses are always present. I assume that dentists were also present, especially considering how um, motivated the Nazis were to pull teeth to create dentures for German populations and pull out um, the fillings to melt them down, but maybe that will be my next study. Uh, you mentioned in terms of sterilization especially that similar experiments were going on in the United States. Uh, did you find any evidence of communication? I mean, they didn't have an internet, but some way of where the German doctors, while they were doing these experiments, even during the war, were communicating with Americans that might have been doing similar things? Um, there became, so the short answer is yes and then no. So there was a lot of communication between um, the Germans in the pre-war years and the United States and even Canada. There is a book called The Nazi Connection that specifically traces that connection between American eugenics and racism and National Socialist policies. Um, there were, in fact, Germans that came over to the United States and were widely celebrated for their research in applied eugenics um, that received research awards from American universities. And there continued to be a lot of cross-collaboration, essentially, until we found out what was going on. And then at that point, we even start to see less discussion of eugenics, um, because we start to associate that with uh, the atrocities of Hitler. Um, I'm a teacher fellow with the Holocaust Museum in DC, and I work with the North Carolina Holocaust Council. And my fellowship project was this, in fact, because I was a high school teacher, um, and we have health science classes. And, and so again, trying to pull the Holocaust into high school curriculum. Um, in, in my research, I did a lot with the American side of this and how the Nazis did come over or Germans came over before and studied um, and copied a lot of our sterilization and those programs that we had 33 states in the country that were sterilizing pre-war um, and that North Carolina had its own eugenics board and that we were third in the country in the number of sterilizations from 1924 until 1974. And they did a lot of the same things. They had um, um, a board of individuals who would read through um, health scripts from a doctor and be, without even being examined, which I saw in some of your um, mm -hmm. um, material, and yes, this person was forcibly sterilized um, told that, that they could have that procedure changed, um, that social welfare workers were also part of this in terms of um, if, you don't become, if you don't go and have this procedure, then we will not give you food stamps, so we will not do these things. Um, any, anything similar that, that you also, um, did you get into that part of it as well? I haven't studied sterilization as much. Um, I do want to repeat your point that yes, the United States kind of led the way in sterilization. We had the first sterilization law of any nation, I think, in 1911, and we sterilized large numbers of people. Um, it was very similar in Germany in that it started with this institutional, institutionalized population and got wider and wider. Um, there was also a lot of use of kind of covert sterilization where they experimented with um, the option of having people essentially come in and fill out paperwork at an irradiated desk that would then just sterilize them passively without their knowledge. So we saw well, in North Carolina, a lot of that. Most people were sterilized I'm sorry. In North Carolina, most of um, our citizens were sterilized after World War II, mm. um, even with what had come out from the Nuremberg trials. 
And I think that one of the reasons that that happened is that there was a very much um, almost a need for us to really feel like this was a unique type of evil that could only happen in Germany. And one of the reasons that, that we talk about the Nuremberg Code, but there was still a lot of unethical research that continued to happen around the world after the Nuremberg Code. And part of that is because we thought, oh, those are Nazis, you know, they're crazy. We would never do that. When, when we're doing it, it's something different. You know, it's something better. Exactly. When really it's I've been wanting to know more about the North Carolina Eugenics Board, so. I'm so Excellent. <laughs> I've got a question. You've been talking about the German bulk, mm -hmm. B-U-L-K. Who is, who is included? I mean, were, was Adolf Hitler part of the German bulk, or was he some, or was he in leading Nazis in a in, uh, deified type of uh, different group? Well, who kind of counts as being a part of the German Volk obviously kind of changes throughout um, the history of that period and later um, to kind of constrain it to uh, the Holocaust. I, I would I would say that the Volk is that kind of Aryan German, or I believe there were specific calculations about the percentage of non-Aryan blood that you could have to still count as being Aryan and in the Volk. And I would say that Hitler at least conceptualized himself as being in the Volk, although we know all of those things about him, about how he was not blonde-haired and blue-eyed, not this perfect Aryan, uh, but he at least conceptualized himself, and I think all of his followers did. Okay, well, so that the the Nazi Party members were were con, were part of the bulk. They weren't. Uh, yeah, they were part of it. It just kind of means kind more, of like more privileged group. It means kind of like German with a capital G for that time period. So it's like those idealized Germans. And I had it on one of my slides, um, but they actually have this kind of chart um, that starts off and it can say, you know, what your who your father and mother are, and then it will tell you where you kind of rank within German society based on the percentage of maybe Jewish blood or maybe, I don't know, gypsy blood or non-Aryan blood or whatever they decided to hate. I, d I did not realize, I teach the Holocaust as well. I'm the Witcher professor this year at ECU. And what I, I did not realize that the doctors were actually the ones on the ramps. Um, so I found that part really fascinating, but I don't know if you've noticed this, and I brought this up with my students, that if you were sent to the left that versus right, that's the same thing with dating apps that we have nowadays. You oh, swipe yeah. left versus you swipe right. So it's a, that's an interesting way that I talk about that with my students. When you, with the dating app, if you have a dating app, you like for a dating right application, you know, when you're, you're on those sites to try and find somebody, and you swipe left versus you swipe right, and so swipe left now, no, no, oh, swipe right. I'll keep. I'll take. <laughs> of course, and that depended too. Now, no one will be able to look at a dating app the same way. <laughs> right, and it is important to note that I'm, I'm sure that, especially as the volume continued to increase of people arriving at concentration camps, I would say it's unlikely that a doctor did all the ramp selections. And in that book, Nazi Doctors, it actually talks about some physicians who refused to do it when they realized what it was. And the other thing that I think I didn't specify on that list was camp selections. Physicians are responsible for camp selections, and that was essentially a physician just deciding that an entire a block of prisoners would be killed, and they would make that decision based on, I don't know, their whim, but also this eugenic ideology, or if there was any case of infectious disease of any member of a barrack, then the entire barrack was euthanized to prevent infection. So the physicians were 